Hello, my name is Chris Nichols. I'm a Garrett County native. Uh, the marker on this map shows the general location of my house, which is a 1930s era log cabin that was built by my grandparents back in the 30s. So I've got some, some fairly deep roots in the area. Uh, I've always loved maps. They give you a great way to travel through space and time without having to leave your desk. And uh, I've done some projects in my day job where I've gotten to work with geospatial information systems, which is a fancy word for mapping software. And I've taken some of that experience to local projects. Found that I discovered a lot of little nuggets about the history of the area through these projects and thought that other people might be interested in some of those. So I put together this presentation about the history of Garrett County is told through maps. Uh, it won't be a comprehensive or, or linear account of the entire history, but just a story that's kind of told through snapshots of cartography. So let's get started. Uh, this map is uh, an early map from uh, 1902, which shows the geology of the county. You can think of a geological map as uh, kind of flattening out the surface uh, of the area and then identifying the, the predominant type of rock and soils that uh, you find there. Uh, the predominant rock types and formation uh, that make up Garrett County are Permian, Mississippian, and Devonian. These are all around uh, 200 to 400 million years old. Uh, they were formed by shales and sandstones and limestones, which were created as, as sediments were deposited, stratified, and solidified over geologic time. During the Carboniferous period of around 350 to 300 million years ago, the biological material uh, that, that created the coal and natural gas deposits were formed uh, as, as layers were deposited and then uh, compressed over millions of years. So John Denver had it right when he said that life is, is old here, not just in West Virginia, but also in, Maryland, in Western Maryland too. This map shows the elevation in the county, a topographical map. We essentially live on a mountain plateau Garrett County is, is sometimes referred to as Maryland's tableland, since to the west and east of us is, is flatter and, and more level, and you come up onto a table as you approach the county from either direction. You can see one of the, the larger natural features of the county, Backbone Mountain, which follows the roughly the eastern border of the county. The highest point in the county and the state of Maryland is down here at the southern tip of Backbone Mountain. So the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains that, that make up most of the topography of the county are actually part of the same mountain chain as the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. These mountains were all formed um, when the Americas and Africa were part of the uh, giant continent of Pangaea. This blue line that runs down the through the county is the Eastern Continental Divide, which means that water falling to the right or east of this line flows, uh, is collected to the Savage River to the Potomac uh, and then out to the Chesapeake Bay and eventually the Atlantic Ocean. Whereas water falling to the right or west or to the left or west of this line is collected mainly through the Yakagani River up into the Monongahela, then Ohio, uh, Mississippi, and out to the Gulf of Mexico. So you can truly say that Garrett County is, is Western as far as the topography is, con is concerned as to where the water goes. This map overlays the general layout of Native American trail systems overlaid on top of a modern day map of the county. The natives in the area were predominantly the uh, Iroquois and Algonquin tribes. There's some interesting uh, trail systems here in the, in the county. The western spur of the Native American Great War Path went through Garrett County and then kind of largely followed Route 50, what is now Route 50. Nemecolon's Trail was an important artery for indigenous people moving 
east and west throughout the area. Uh, the National Freeway or, or Route 40 and uh, I-68 uh, largely follow the route of this trail now. Um, but in spite of kind of the, the, the thoroughfares that pass through the county, there's little evidence that a lot of uh, long-term settlements uh, were, were created by the indigenous people here in Garrett County. It seems that they preferred to use the area more as a seasonal hunting ground. But you can see that many of today's modern roadways, so as we said, Route 40, Route 50, 219, uh, Route 42, a lot of these major roads that exist now largely follow the paths established by the Native Americans. And you can see that people generally find the quick and, quickest and easiest path to wherever they're going but generally it's, it does seem that they avoided the central part of the the county what would become deep creek lake uh, and that's not just because they wanted to avoid the tourism traffic uh, but obviously deep creek lake didn't exist then and it was more of a marshy swampy area that was more difficult to travel through so most of their trails did avoid uh, the area that would become deep creek lake these two maps show some of the natural resources of the county. They're dated from 1902, showing uh, the natural resources, and 1918 on the right, showing the, the forest cover of the county. And around the turn of the 20th century, most of the resources in the county were things that either grew in the ground or you could dig out of the ground. So coal, fire clay, lime, all of these are, are mineral-based resources. There was, uh, there, there are, and, and uh, there were, and still are, uh, coal mining operations in the county. There was a fairly large fire clay kiln that made uh, bricks from the fire clay in the area. Uh, there's still some some mineral uh, aggregate uh, producers in the area as well. Most of the other resources were farming related, so uh, uh, buckwheat, potatoes, uh, corn those type of uh, resources and uh, a lot of livestock uh, production and, and uh, uh, raising in, that happened in the southern part of the county. As for the forest cover, around that time, the, the county was and still is uh, highly forested and, and covered by uh, trees. And uh, that was a, a major uh, resource industrial area for the county uh, of, as far as timber extraction and, and uh, production of, of forest uh, pro products. This map shows the extent of what could have been Garrett County or uh, Maryland. So when Charles I was dividing up lands among his uh, lords, so in this case uh, he divided the land between uh, Lord Fairfax uh, of Virginia and Lord Baltimore of Maryland he used the Potomac River was was the dividing line between their two territories and the western extent of their territories went to the headwaters of the Potomac River. But what wasn't known at that point was that the Potomac River really seemed to have two equal sized branches, the North Branch and the South Branch. And depending on which branch was, was selected as the dividing line between the areas, obviously made a, a huge difference, both in terms of the uh, north-south extent of each Lord's claim and the east-west uh, extent, since the headwaters for the south branch are significantly further to the west and south than the headwaters of the north branch. As it turns out, the north branch was the the branch that was selected to be the dividing line and uh, Lord Baltimore really got robbed out of a, a significant chunk of land that could have been part of Maryland uh, and up till 1910 some of the difficulties that came out of this you know selection of the North Branch continued until 1910 when there was actually a disputed strip of land between Maryland and West Virginia that the Supreme Court had to uh, decide in a in a case and they ended up coming out and, and 
um, favor more of West Virginia, so the land was the line was further moved moved over to the east. But uh, it's interesting to to note that there was a kind of neutral zone between the two states uh, up until 1910, when the Supreme Court uh, made, drew the final line. This is one of the earliest maps uh, that shows any of the features of the county. This is from 1775. Uh, it really shows more detail of what is Maryland and Virginia over to the east. But it is uh, an important map because it starts to fill in some of these areas uh, over in, in the western part of the state. But for the most part, it was a total wild land at that point in 1775. The southern border of the county what would become garrett county is 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 here is the not as the potomac but as the cohongo ronto river and the formalized naming of this waterway as the potomac river didn't happen until later so various maps show it either as the cohongo ronto or the potomac i think i'm i'm happy that they settled on the potomac river but i wish they'd kept some of these other cooler names like the Styx river down here I don't think that currently exists anymore um, but as far as any other features in the area really there's only one actual uh, settlement or man-made feature that's noted on this map of a generic coal mine uh, here on the Potomac River and uh, some of these streams and creeks have have uh, Laurel Creek is still uh, named that and, and is generally where that is located. But for the most part, the area was a complete wild land that was um, poorly understood and mapped and, and very sparsely settled, if at all. In uh, 1932, the state of Maryland commissioned uh, uh, some surveyors and map makers to make a map commemorating the 200th birthday of George Washington. So this is a zoomed in version uh, view of that map showing generally Garrett County. And the map showed all of the routes and some of the locations that George Washington took uh, throughout his various travels in the colonies and, and the new country. And I think it's fairly well known that George Washington traveled uh, along the, what is the National Road, this northern route, um, during his service as a, a, a British uh, uh, army officer um, under General Braddock. Uh, so he traveled this route a number of times in the northern part of the county. But what is m possibly well less known is that he traveled through the southern edge of the county. And this was in 1784. And this was during a trip that he took to Periopolis, uh, Pennsylvania, so uh, up, up somewhat close to Pittsburgh. He went up there to inspect some uh, lands that, ironically enough, he was awarded for his service in, in the French and Indian War as a British military officer. And then on the way back from that trip, he came back through uh, on a somewhat bushwhacking expedition uh, back through uh, what would become West Virginia and then down through the southern part of the county and his goal on this journey was to identify possible waterways and routes for uh, the extension of the CNO canal and uh, that was one of his pet projects was to eventually be able to link the uh, essentially the Atlantic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico through a canal uh, which you know up to that point uh, was really only planned that they only had a good route up to Cumberland and uh, the Potomac River becomes unnavigable and, and the, the terrain becomes rough. So he was looking for a route that would be able to connect uh, this point in the CNO Canal all the way out to essentially the Ohio River. Obviously, that was never completed, but he did make a couple of stops through the southern portion of Garrett County on his uh, travels and, and explorations for that uh, CNO Canal route. Also around this time, the, uh, the new states um, had some, some strategies for both rewarding uh, soldiers who, were, who had served in their militias during the Revolutionary War and also for populating some of the sparsely populated areas of their states. And that was by awarding 
lots of land to military veterans for their service uh, in the Revolutionary War. So this larger map on the left shows the the way that the county uh, was divided up into these nicely ordered military lots, and then some of these other ones were uh, claims had already been made or, or had you know already been traded away but for the most part you see some nice orderly grids of, of lots that uh, were awarded to the soldiers for their service uh, during the Revolutionary War and this inset map shows a detail with Deep Creek Lake's uh, shoreline current shoreline superimposed to kind of show where the lake would have lain um, in respect to these original plots. And uh, there's some really, really amazingly named uh, plots of land here. There's you know, the first rights of the first part of the rights of man and addition to Eden's paradise regained, uh, pink of the Allegheny. And when I first made this map, I was really excited to see which cool name uh, my, my house laid on. But when I actually did the research, it was the very disappointingly named ox pasture that uh, the plot of land that, that my house is on. So if you have a, a house in the area, you can use this type of map to track down, you know, if you had a, a very cool uh, original plot of land that your house is on today. This map shows uh, from 1838 shows that the county by then was was by the early 1800s was just starting to to get filled in as far as the uh, understanding of the the geography the the topography some of the the bigger natural features uh, it was still part of allegheny or it still was allegheny county at that point in 1838 and uh many of the natural features are are being well described here on the in the map um, so, you know, we see the Yakagani River, we see some of the, the major mountains, um, and of course we don't see Deep Creek Lake, but we see Deep Creek in here. Um, and this current area, area of the, the early 1800s was the prime of Meshik Browning. Uh, he was a, an early settler of the county and, and, and settled in a number of homesteads around what would become Garrett County. He also wrote the book 44 Years of the Life of a Hunter, which chronicled uh, both his hunting stories and uh, has some great details about what life was like as a pioneer in the area um, during this time period. What's interesting is that the only permanent settlement in what would become Garrett County that's noted on this map, Selby's Port, is the only uh, settlement that's noted by Meshik Browning in his book as well. So although there were some more settlements in the, in the southern part of the county, they really only became larger as the railroad came in um, later in the 1800s. And we'll look at that in one of the next maps. So these maps are, um, this map is from 1873. Garrett County was split off as its own county from uh, Allegheny County in 1872. So this atlas must have just caught that, that new change. Um, and by this point, by the late 1800s, um, much of the county is, is becoming familiar to modern day map readers as far as uh, the larger towns. You know, we see Accident and Grantsville, um, of course, Oakland, Deer Park, um, and some of the other ones that, that are more familiar. We see now that the uh, b &O rail line is a prominent feature on the map. Um, but some of the, the towns on here, Frankville, uh, Fort Pendleton, um, some of these have kind of come and gone and, and uh, no, one, no one has any sign of those anymore. Um, on the right is a map of the major roadways of the county from 1899. And you can see the uh, national road, the, they call it an abandoned toll road, but it was still a, a working road at that point. And essentially the routes of 219 going south through the county and uh, what is now Maryland 42 uh, here as well. In the next series of maps, we're going to look at the development of the lake and, and how things have changed 
over time uh, from where the lake was and, and where it is now. So in the background of this map is a uh, 1901 topographical map and uh, the blue outline is the current outline and, and uh, surface area of the lake. So you can see uh, before the lake was there, as I talked about in, in the earlier slides, a lot of the area of the what is now the lake was kind of marshy and swampy, as indicated along in here, um, and may not have been you know the, the best area to try and get through. But you can see some interesting features. You can you know see the the course of uh, Deep Creek following kind of the main uh, course of the lake. Uh, there was a, a, a dam um, right around where the Glendale Bridge is today that was a uh, uh, aquaculture dam for raising fish. And it was just created a tiny little lake right there, um, but that was the, one of the first dams on Deep Creek before the larger dam that uh, created the entire Deep Creek Lake. And we'll s look through some of the next slides and we'll see how Things have changed uh, since 1901 uh, when the, when, and how the lake is formed after that. This is an interesting overlay of a couple, uh, one old layer and one very new layer. So in the background is a, the, that topographical map from 1901. So you can see, and we're right around the 219 bridge. So this is where today's 219 bridge is. You can see the the area of this zoom in right there. So the current 219 bridge is here. So this would be what is today Rock Lodge Road. And before the lake was here, that roadway came across and uh, crossed what is Deep Creek. This orange area is uh, bathymetry scans that were performed by the Department of Natural Resources around uh, 2012. So this shows the the surface uh, of the lake bed, the, the features of the surface of the lake bed that is underneath the water now. So you can see the course of Deep Creek as it uh, is still maintained underneath the water. You can see where that road crossed over Deep Creek and came out on the other side. And you can actually see the remnants of uh, probably what was a farm that was right on the, the banks of the Deep Creek here. You can see the foundation of some sort of house, probably a farmhouse, and nice orderly rows of stumps along here, which was likely uh, an orchard for that farm or that settlement. So it's uh, pretty fascinating. You can still see a lot of the details of what was here in 1901 uh, that is still just underneath the surface of the lake. In these next four slides, we're gonna have the, the view continue to be at the same scale and the same view. So you'll be able to see uh, as we switch through these, we'll step through time and see when the lake came into existence and then how it's become more populated over the years. So we're, we're looking more at the southern area of the lake. You can see Pond Run here. You can see Green Glade Run. You can see the original course of Deep Creek. And keep your eye on the roads, roadways, as you uh, look through the next, this next slide, and you can see how they've changed as well. So now we have Deep Creek Lake has filled in. This is a map from 1949. All the little uh, black squares represent uh, mostly houses, but some sort of permanent structure. You can see some of those roadways that would have just continued uh, back in 1901, now just dead end where the lake has kind of dead ended them. Um, and you can continue to see, you know, you've got Green Glade, you have Deep Creek, now becoming Deep Creek Lake, and you see some. Um, structures along the on the southern part of the lake uh, in 1938 a newsletter that I found from the Deep Creek Lake Property Owners Association had the following census of uh, uh, lake structures that they had performed with 139 cottages eight camps 137 approved water supplies 
81 sanitary privies, 52 unsanitary privies, and 82 flush toilets. So, uh, you know, around 150 kind of permanent uh, resident, not res not full time, but, you know, a, a structure around the lake um, in 1938. By 1949, it probably maybe double that at that point. And then we'll switch to 25 years later. In 1974, we see a lot more uh, houses and, and buildings starting to grow in along the uh, southern part of the lake. Uh, in a 1962 vacation guide that I found that they insist that only one quarter of the lake shore has been developed and there's still room for you. So there was still a good bit even by the mid 70s of lake shore that had not yet been developed and there was still you know, a lot of area where you could buy a piece of land and put in a house. Now let's uh, zoom forward another I think 30. Oh no this is just five years later uh, showing even yet more developed kind of a, some more along turkey neck. Um, some more in the Thousand Acres and Sky Valley area. And now I think we'll go around 30 uh, in advance. And you can see a lot more development in some of those areas where uh, there had been virtually no homes at all. So over the past 30 years or so, the, the, the uh, buildup of the lake has really risen pretty quickly. So in the last couple of slides, I'm, I look at a couple of uh, future views of what the, the maps of the, the lake in the uh, Garrett County area could be. So this, show, this map shows the energy landscape of uh, Garrett County. And we'll step through all of the different layers here. We've got uh, black triangles that show coal mines, active coal mines in and around Garrett County. Uh, we've got yellow, these yellow shapes represent wind farms, so the electricity producing wind turbines, uh, mainly in the county, they follow the, that, the Backbone Mountain Ridge, which is where the wind resources are the highest. Uh, one interesting snapshot of this map is that this was made in 2013, and this was the height of uh, speculation for uh, natural gas production in the county. Uh, the hydraulic fracturing in natural gas was, of course, banned by the state of Maryland in 2017, and that effectively uh, curtailed any uh, future production of, of natural gas in the county. But you can see that these, all of these purple areas were where uh, natural gas exploration and production companies had leased the land from the landowners uh, to, to lock in the production of gas from all this land. So there was a lot of interest in producing natural gas in Garrett County uh, until that ban was implemented. But uh, natural gas is still an important, uh, there's still important infrastructure for natural gas in the county. You can see this uh, big pipeline in the, the blue for natural gas essentially follows the Mason-Dixon line. And there's a very important uh, natural gas storage field right around Accident, Maryland that uh, is served by this pipeline, which uh, is uh, kind of feeds into the rest of the Northeast's gas system. So this is an important part of the, uh, the, the, the Eastern East Coast's natural gas system is a storage field right here. Um, and there's other resources in the area. There's a lot of, uh, of course, uh, timber and uh, agricultural uh, energy sources that could be utilized. Um, so this is one potential uh, snapshot of, of what an energy future could look like in the county or option or another option is uh, a view of the trails in the county. So this is courtesy of uh, Garrett Trails and shows the trail systems throughout the county, both you know state and private uh, privately made uh, trails. And I like to show this as the kind of a return to that uh, those trails that we showed of the Native Americans throughout the county. And this type of future for the county would leverage uh, more of that wilderness and uh, 
uh, wildness of the county and and use that as the uh, big economic resource that uh, brought in others to share uh, the value of the county. Uh, and since there's nothing that's for free, uh, you've gotten to sit through all of these great maps. Um, and I'm just going to do a quick commercial for two of the organizations that I'm involved with that I think could contribute to some of uh, this type of future. One is the Deep Creek Lake Lions Club. Um, we're developing a trail system that is themed around the Meshick Browning's life and times at our park on Bumblebee Road. Uh, so that's one project that I think supports this uh, type of natural resource development um, in a positive way. And the other one is uh, the Deep Creek Lake Property Owners Association uh, who supports and protects the Deep Creek Lake watershed um, through its advocacy efforts. So there are many other organizations uh, in and around Garrett County that, and I encourage you to find and support an organization that aligns with your personal interests. This is a list of a lot of the good resources that I've found uh, in developing this presentation. You don't have to rush to write these down because on the next slide, I show a link and uh, get it in full with those links are active. So you can download this full presentation at my website, dimesy.com, for free. It's uh, publicly available. If you have any questions or comments or just want to uh, chat about anything you saw in here, you are welcome to contact me, dimesy23 at gmail.com. And uh, thanks for taking this journey with me. I hope that uh, whatever roads you happen to choose, they take you on an interesting journey.